Hi, hey, everybody. We're just uh, waiting a few moments to let uh, everybody kind of enter the space, and we'll get started in just a moment. All right, looks like we're starting to round off on those numbers. So we'll go ahead and get us started this morning. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. Uh, depending on where you're dialing in from. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for our half day virtual event, Inclusive, a faculty focused showcase of equitable and effective teaching practices. I'm Dr. Megan Tassin. I'm the director of the Personalized Learning Consortium at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. For the past few years, the PLC has been working in partnership with Achieving the Dream and the Every Learner Everywhere Network to work closely with faculty and their institutions on grant work that provides deep support um, in the redesign of introductory and gateway courses, in the adoption and integration of educational technology into course design, and development and implementation support of equitable teaching practices. And through this work with community colleges and public universities, we overwhelmingly heard from faculty and their institutions that one of the biggest benefits of this grant work was the collaboration and community building of faculty, uh, both within and across disciplines, um, but particularly among faculty who teach within the same discipline. And this served as the impetus for launching a disciplinary communities of practice initiative, which took place over the 2021 and 22 academic year. And today's event is gonna showcase several of the lessons learned from those communities in the form of multiple sessions. So the summit is going to feature practical approaches to effective, equitable, and technology supported teaching and learning. Faculty from across disciplines and institutions are gonna share their experiences, applying principles of culturally responsive teaching, digital learning, community building, and data informed instruction, all to meet the needs of their courses and students. The event is an opportunity for both faculty and the administrative support staff um, who, who help those folks, um, help them connect with like-minded peers to learn about emerging practices and engage in discussions about how to adapt strategies and resources for new and distinct teaching situations. We're gonna start with a keynote and kickoff with our colleague and friend, Dr. Rwanda Garth McCullough, followed by a moderated panel with students and faculty who are gonna discuss how and why equitable teaching is so valuable. In the following session, we'll hear from faculty and education experts about emphasizing care and empathy in our instruction. How can we best understand who our students are? How do we connect with them? And how do we best serve them? Following that session, attendees are gonna have the opportunity to join a breakout session with their peers where they can engage with colleagues about the pedagogical challenges they face in teaching within their unique discipline. These sessions are gonna be facilitated by expert faculty and we'll have sessions for math, writing, the sciences, and an administrative session. And the last session is going to include a discussion with instructional design and learning technology experts who are gonna give uh, attendees explicit examples of the educational tools and instructional design strategies that faculty can employ to engage with students, to create a sense of belonging, and to build community. And then we'll finally close out with remarks from the Every Learner Everywhere director, Dr. Jessica Williams. Again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for this event. We're gonna turn things over to Dr. Rwanda Garth McCullough. Dr. Garth McCullough is the Director of Program Development at Achieving the Dream. There she leads the Every Learner Everywhere Digital Learning Initiative. Her expertise in culturally relevant teaching guides her professional development work in the equity and inclusion space. She's worked with colleges and K through 12 schools to educate staff and instructors on the methods of culturally responsive teaching and to revise curriculum across disciplines. Rwanda supports educators to invite and integrate their students' cultural knowledge as a cognitive tool in service of their achievement and success. Through her workshops and coaching, she leads teams of educators to investigate equity uh, for each element of their practice, whether we're talking policies, syllabi, and instruction to assessments. And over for 12 years, uh, Dr. Marth Colo was also a faculty member in the School of Education at Loyola University of Chicago, and she is a proud graduate of the University of Chicago and Westland U University. Uh, Rwanda, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, Dr. Chassin. I am delighted to be here with you today for this faculty-focused showcase to talk about teaching practices that promote inclusion and equity. It is an honor to be among like-minded educators who share my passion for effective student-centered strategies. After your time with us today, I hope you take away an understanding of how teaching 
and learning plays a critical role in institutional transformation. I will also share equity-minded teaching and learning practices that faculty are using to interrogate who is being served by the curriculum, identify and disrupt practices that are perpetuating the status quo, and redesign their pedagogy to center student learning. As soon as I can move that, there we go. Um, before I get started, I wanted to first tell you a little bit about the great student and equity focused collaboration that is the Every Learner Everywhere Network. Achieving the Dream, APLU and, on, and the OLC, Online Learning Consortium, are not only the co-sponsors of this event today, but we are partners in the Every Learner Everywhere Network, which includes nine other organizations who share our drive to advance equity by transforming post-secondary teaching and learning. Rwanda, I just wanted to chime in real quick. I'm not seeing your slides if you are sharing them at this point. Oh, good point. <laughs> Sorry. All good. <laughs> we'll all get there together. <laughs> are you seeing them now? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, okay, good, good. Sorry about that. Um, our collective mission is to help institutions use technology to innovate teaching and learning with the ultimate goal of improving student outcomes for Black, Latino, Latina, Indigenous po and poverty affected and first generation students. Based on achieving the dreams learnings from the field, we have created a framework to support colleges to develop a culture of teaching and learning excellence that is necessary to respond to the institutional urgency and see equitable, scaled, and systemic results that our communities require from us now more than ever. Our focus today aligns strongly with the first cornerstone. This cornerstone centers the importance of instructional quality with the understanding that the educational reform community is often out of their comfort zone when it comes to deep instructional work. And faculty are often left um, away from the, not at the table when institutional decisions are being made. While we acknowledge that what happens in the classroom is at the core of any college or university, we have tinkered all around it and wonder why we can only move the needle so far. Studies show what faculty do in the classroom makes a difference to not only student learning experiences, but retainment and graduation rates. And it is no longer enough to have a few faculty members like yourselves in some departments who use the evidence-based practices that have proven to foster learning for our most vulnerable students. It shouldn't be that it is the luck of the draw whether a Latina or first-generation African-American student enrolls in the one chem chemistry course with the one instructor who is elected to attend PD sessions on their own time or a conference on culture responsive teaching and has taken the initiative to conduct an equity analysis of their course <clears throat> to think about and rethink and redesign and integrate teaching moves that connect with students' cultural funds of knowledge. I think you would agree that our students simply deserve more. I'm making an assumption here, but I'm going to assume that like me, the faculty members and the academic leaders here today, today logged on because we have tried various strategies in our courses and have had some successes as well as challenges. We share a common um, concern about the inequitable outcomes in our departments and in our institutions. And if we closed our eyes <clears throat> right now and stilled our mind uh, long enough, we would picture the faces of students we tried to reach but couldn't and are in search of strategies that could have made an impact on those students. Working at ATD and with the Every Learner Everywhere Network has afforded many opportunities for me to apply my research on culture responsive teaching and equity-minded teaching practices in higher education. The focus of my research was on the effect of culturally bound prior knowledge on African-American students reading comprehension. And I conducted a study that involved prior knowledge assessment and reading comprehension assessment 
to identify the role cultural information plays in learning for students who are across the academic performance spectrum. And what I found was that culturally bound prior knowledge had a significant effect for mid-level readers to the extent that their comprehension scores rivaled the high performing students. This finding confirmed the hypothesis that learning can be positively impacted when students can access and leverage their cultural ways of knowing and being an academic task in ways that enhance their performance. When I was teaching educators, the challenge uh, became how to design and scale the instructional practices that invited and used cultural knowledge like Carol Lee's cultural modeling framework. Dr. Lee worked with students' knowledge of rap lyrics and African-American vernacular English to scaffold their understanding of literary elements. And if you haven't had a chance to see the video um, and data that she has, it is, it is really amazing. You get an opportunity to see the students' progression of literary analysis, analysis from Fuji lyrics to Toni Morrison's Beloved. And since then, educators like Carol Lee, and Zaretta Hammond in the humanities and Christopher Emden in STEM have done amazing work on scalable, culturally relevant strategies, approaches in the K-12 space. And I don't know if this has been your experiences, but for this past seven years, I've been working more directly with faculty and my sense is that K-12 seems to be ahead of the game when it comes to integrating inclusive and equitable teaching practices. <clears throat> From my experience, the post-secondary um, space is more comfortable acknowledging historical atrocities than they are addressing the root causes that show up in our curriculum and in our <clears throat> teaching practices. We have perpetual, perpetual inequitable outcomes, so it is no wonder that Black, Latino, and Latina, Indigenous, poverty-affected women, queer, non-Christian, non-able-bodied, or non-neurotypical students don't experience a sense of belonging when they walk on our campuses, log into the LMS, look at the course syllabi, read the assigned text, or complete a traditional summative assessment. It honestly troubles me to quantify the amount of bias, microaggression, insults, racism, sexism, homophobia, and privileged elitism that is baked into traditional higher education processes, practices, and policies. <clears throat> and so in higher education, we have work to do to make our courses and our teaching experiences more inclusive. And institutions need to understand that faculty need support and time to work on the curriculum, interrogate pedag their pedagogical practices that perpetuate and dismantle the, and redesign the learning environment in ways that create supportive partnerships between students and faculty. For the past few decades, we've been gap gazing and, and wondering, and I wonder how many students have been pushed out or stopped out while institutional looked at pages upon pages of charts that look similar to this? <clears throat> and, and how many equity making conversations could have been happening um, while we, this data was um, routinely interpreted full of student and, and student blame and deficit thinking? And if you can, I would love for you to put in the chat some of the examples of pop, that are popular at your institution for student blame and um, deficit thinking rationale. Dr. Estella Ben-Simone offers a sense-making tool that helps focus the interpretive analysis of data by asking instead, what practitioners, policies, practices, and programs may have a connection or be a factor in the inequitable outcomes? And so this puts the, the spotlight on the institution instead of the students. She offers these questions that prompt to drive the discussion to action and away from deficit thinking and student blaming. Deficit discourse allows educators to talk about marginalized student groups in class and race coded ways without the fear of being called out on racist or classist views. 
And much of the work um, to promote inclusive practices begins with the change, the changing, with changing the dominant narrative that is embedded in the way we think and speak about students we serve. There is a need for transformation in our institutions, teaching and learning practices. In order to have inclusive learning environments, we have to address the inequities in the classroom to transform these spaces that acknowledge students' identities and address these inequitable practices. And as committed and invested faculty, we have a powerful calling and a significant role to play in institutional transformation. Faculty are in a unique position to bring about much needed change to the student learning experience. And I think we, we, we can no longer wait for others to be the leaders that we've been waiting for. And thank you for the myths and, and the deficit thinking that you're putting in the chat. I have heard many of these um, in, in the trainings and workshops and webinars that we do. Um, but I am convinced that working together with intentional groups of like-minded faculty at your institution, we can move the needle on student success rates by interrogating who, their, who our curriculum serves, constantly asking the questions about how we are serving our students and which students we are serving, disrupting how we teach and what we teach that perpetuates the status quo, and redesigning courses in ways that center students' learning. It is imperative that faculty begin taking an honest look at what we could be doing differently to better teach the students we serve. And also gathering information from our students and getting feedback about how, how they are experiencing the learning environment in the course or the course policies or the pace of the assessments or the, <clears throat> the amount of, of work and the quality of the work in terms of their, their own learning. So this work requires defining and committing to equity beyond, the, beyond it being the um, trendy buzzword or what I have come to call equity gloss where it's just painted on every heading as, as an afterthought. And one place to start is developing a shared understanding of what equity is and, and what it isn't and how it differs from related concepts. And we find these um, slides from the Center for Urban Education, very helpful to think about the difference in, um, in, in, in what equality asks of us and in what, um, uh, what diversity uh, initiatives um, are, are geared to do. So when you look at these slides, which I'm sure some of you have seen before, it, you know, it really infers that, you know, that, there's, that we're operating on a level playing field. But we are all know that our, um, if we approach classrooms and education with an equality mindset, we are losing sight of our students as individuals and the previous experiences that they, that they have had. Some come with many privileges and um, support structures that are geared towards their, um, their success in, um, in, in higher education. And others, and you, you can see all the way on the um, on the other side, are coming. You know, they're they're coming from below ground and deal with so many issues, um, including the um, systemic bias, systemic racism, and bias that is baked into all of our U.S. institutions and in our culture, and the, and not recognizing that our institutions of higher education were not built with women students of color, poverty affected students, student parents, veterans, foster youth, formerly incarcerate, incarcerated in mind, but yet we are still wonder why we have the un, unequitable, inequitable outcomes. And, and this is really a call to action for us to stop the gap gazing, stop the wondering and get to the work of, of fixing and recognizing that Many of our diversity initiatives are bringing different, a more diverse range of students into an inequitable um, system. And so that's not what we wanna be doing. While racial diversity is definitely a worthy goal, um, if we don't fix the system, we, we can't be surprised 
if our outcomes continue to be what they are. And so with equity, equity takes an intentional and focused effort to create um, an environment for our students and requires a shift that is often uncomfortable for, um, for educators who have been taught that the right way to treat our students and the right way to teach is to teach everyone the same. So engaging methods of cultural responsive teaching puts institutions on a path to create equitable, meaningful, and inclusive learning environments for students. At Achieving the Dream, we define, we de developed a definition of equity as this intentional practice of identifying, dismantling unjust structures, policies, and practices that perpetuate systemic oppression based on, but not limited to race, ethnicity, gender identity, language, disability, sexual orientation, economic status, and or religion to establish corrective justice actions to realize students' academic and social mobility goals. If, the equi if equity is the outcome, cultural responsiveness is one way um, to address it. And it is really the way that equity is operationalized. It should be the way it looks and feels like in the spaces where we create, that we create for our students. Gloria Latson Billings first coined the term culturally relevant teaching. And, and when she wrote her book, uh, Dream Keepers, now decades ago, she changed the narrative of the question to what these students can't do, to what and how they can do, and what we need to do to better support our students and their academic and um, career goals. Dr. Sean Harper also clarifies the idea of taking the onus from students and says that it is on us as educators. So we have to ask the questions, what do we see as the purpose of education? Culturally responsive teaching requires that this eradication of the deficit-based ideology and a disruption of the idea of Eurocentric middle-class forms of discourse, knowledge, language, and culture as normative. And, this, and the importance of creating critical consciousness that challenge the injustice and inequities and oppression that are in our systems and in our practices. It also requires the authentic and culturally informed notion of care and the recognition of the complexity of culture. So what I'm going to do is run through very quickly um, instructional practices that do the that do these three things that um, I'm that we're highlighting here today. Sorry that you now know my Norton um, is uh, expired. Um, so we're going to talk about instructional practices that in, in that help faculty interrogate their their own practices. And so um, we'll first start with um, equitizing the sil the syllabus and that we also take from um, the Center for Urban Education. The, the syllabus review process that Q um, has um, helps faculty identify opportunities in their own syllabi um, to integrate six equity-minded equity practices. And these six equity-minded practices include welcoming, a welcoming tone and language that communicate care and support, um, uh, um, where, you know, looking for opportunities where representation of a range of racial and ethnic experiences can be uh, found in your syllabi and in your assignments and readings. Um, how are you validating students' ability to be successful communicate in communicating the belief that all students are expected to succeed? And, um, demystifying college policies and practices, which is so important to first generation students and also destigmatizing um, um, destigmatizing um, the supports that your campus or your local community offer and, and, and creating a partnership between faculty and students to work together for their success while deconstructing 
and promoting awareness and critical examination of students' assumptions of beliefs and privilege. And this practice has been very, uh, very we found this to be very um, effective as an on-ramp for students who are, um, for students, for faculty, who are looking at um, kind of a starter place for how to look at um, their, their, their practices and to think about who their syllabus speaks to and um, serves. The second strategy um, is a little more of an investment of time and it's the culturally responsive curriculum scorecard that um, uh, achieving the dream adapted from uh, NYU's Metro Center. And it is really a powerful tool that helps you analyze your curriculum um, based off of um, representation, the portrayal of diversity, power, and privilege. It asks questions about how you're centering multiple perspectives, connecting learning to real life and action. And NYU has this um, scorecard for um, humanities and um, STEM, STEM fields, but it, 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 is, it is a K-12 tool. Achieving the Dream has adapted it, a combined version of that for um, the post-secondary space. And we find um, the scoring um, process and the action plan um, to be really a great way to start conversations amongst groups of faculty and academic leaders. And you will, you will get a score um, based on um, everyone's assessment from that and will put you in a range of from culturally destructive to culturally responsive. The, thir the third tool is um, our latest tool from Every Learner Everywhere. It's an equity review tool that guides educators to interrogate their practices um, and reflect on equitable language usage and employ strategies um, that support more equitable teaching and learning practice. Um, learning process. So each step ensures that the instructional materials being used are conceptualized and constructed, leveraging equity-minded skill sets and processes. Um, and so you'll see here, it takes you through a step-by-step -step process from that critical introspection to um, developing and revising equity-minded materials. And then the third final step is reviewing of, of these materials. And it has, um, in addition to the step-by-step -step guidance, the equity review tool has um, 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 application strategies, critical questions, and really a strong list of resources. And the, and the few highlights that, that, we'll, that we have time to talk about today, there are many highlights, but um, it, has a, it includes a great list of um, common understanding of terminology and an equity language guide that is based off of um, Estella Ben Simone's uh, document review process and helps uh, helps us know not only what words we what terms and words and concepts we should be using, but it also gives the why. We we also have. Um, found this uh, op peer observation tool to be very useful um, for faculty to work with each other to look at who's being um, privileged and in, in their courses. And so it, it, it involves a peer observation where some, you ask one of your colleagues or someone to come in and observe your teaching and take note each time a student speaks. And then you would um, you would um, analyze by um, your your student demographics, and then conduct a sense making conversation with um, with each other to help you um, work through uh, you know critically and constructively examining um, the messaging and the instructional practices that might that you might be favoring some student groups over others. Un unknowingly. And this work um, was from James Gray from Community College of Aurora, as is this, this next strategy that I find to be very useful in, um, in, in disaggregating 
uh, your racialized patterns of student attendance and um, where and, and um, the grades they're getting on, on homework and, and assessments. The second set of strategies is around disruption. Um, and so we talked a lot about culturally responsive teaching, and I just wanted to highlight some of the digital tools that can be useful um, in th this uh, culturally responsive approach of prior knowledge assessment and activating prior knowledge. And also, and thinking about culturally sustaining pedagogy, here's um, an example from a tribal college of how they, um, they center native knowledge um, in their learning of science. Anti-racist is all, anti-racist teaching practices also disrupt um, our traditional status quo and, you know, and look at ways that we can remove barriers and be transparent and accountable for our, our, our um, actions um, in, in the class. And here's an example for English language learners of, of anti-racist practices that we need to be aware of um, when we're developing our curriculum and um, and in our pedagogy. And I I have a strong um, <laughs> connection with service learning. I think that it, it's a wonderful opportunity to invite uh, students' cultural knowledge and invoke their, their, their social justice while you know, connecting with the curriculum and the community in very meaningful ways. The third set um, is, in, is in redesigning the curriculum. And um, there are a few practices that I'll, um, I'll end with here, but that help us um, think through um, how we can redesign our curriculum and center students in, in meaningful ways. And one is the use of adaptive courseware, which helps us um, really capture and connect with the student's experience of the course in real time. And there are many options in, um, of courseware products and they, they, we, and we, and they range in, um, in terms of adaptability. Um, but uh, every, through every learner, we've done um, a wonderful, um, we've done really deep work with a few wonderful or, um, institutions, two and four year institutions. And we have a set of case studies um, on um, the Ever Learn Everywhere um, website. If you ever want to uh, look at how different disciplines have um, applied the adaptive um, courseware pedagogy and aligning it with evidence based teaching practices. It's a little uh, shameless plug here. Um, that of, of the uh, case studies that we did. But one thing that the adaptive courseware and, and, and it, it doesn't even have to be adaptive courseware, um, but courseware can support faculty to do in ways that are less laborious, because I do know that there's not a lot of time to be, um, you know, a lot, in fact, we don't, what we don't have is time. And so one thing that is, I think, imperative when we're talking about equitable teaching and learning practices is data-informed instruction. And the courseware provides um, not only the student with um, a data, I mean, not only the faculty with a data bash dashboard, but students with the data dash, with data dashboards. And for faculty, it it's, can be used to, to, you know, for groupings, to um, figure out what, you know, about pacing or anything that you need to reteach. Um, and it's really, really, really um, useful in, um, to, to make um, data-informed um, instructional decisions. The last two that I'll close with is, um, is uh, open pedagogy which um, is a wonderful opportunity to co-construct curriculum with students and um, increase access um, to students um, to a wider network of teaching and learning materials. And then lastly, um, differentiated instruction is another um, pedagogical approach that K-12 has had great success with that I think warrants more attention um, in, um, in higher ed to help us um, 
individualized instruction for groups of students that are exper that experience our teaching in, in different ways. So I will end with the call to action again. Um, we want to find ways to and um, support faculty to interrogate instructional practices, learn, you know, which instructional practices work in, at, in their institutional context. These are not one and none of these are one size fits all. And that's probably some of the reason why um, they haven't taken off. You have to make you have to figure out how it works for, in your institution with the supports that you have and with the students that you serve and providing faculty with safe and supported opportunities for full-time and adjunct faculty to practice this. We can't expect that once a, a faculty member uses this one semester that their you know, outcomes are gonna go off the charts. We need, we need safe spaces and support to practice this and to work in communities of practice um, to learn from each other and to measure the impact um, of these, sir, uh, of these um, practices uh, in, in a disaggregated way so that we can really figure out what, what, where we need to redesign and what we want to scale. So with that, I thank you. Um, and I will turn it back over to Mike to take us to the next uh, section. Thank you, Dr. Garth McCullough, for the, uh, that really important call to action. Uh, so many great resources shared in, in your presentation and also in the chat. So thanks to our participants for um, the lively chat and, uh, and links that you're sharing as well. Um, we're going to jump right into our next session, which is called Students and Faculty Speak. Um, so we always, we have, we've, we've held student panels in the past at conferences and summits like this. Um, we always find them to be really energizing and insightful. Um, and for this particular summit, we thought it would be useful to, uh, to have students and faculty in conversation with one another um, about uh, equitable and effective teaching practices um, from, from both the student and the instructor perspective. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce A. Trey Keith, uh, who will be moderating the discussion, and Ray will then introduce the panelists. And so A. Trey Keith brings 25 years of professional experience in higher education, K-12, and nonprofit community-based organizations. He currently serves as program development consultant at Achieving the Dream. At the core of his work is diversity, equity, and inclusion, while improving educational outcomes for students of color through practices that validate and affirm their cultures, identities, and lived experiences. Ray is committed to disrupting the status quo and developing faculty and instructor, instructors that take a student-centered and holistic approach to culturally responsive and culturally relevant teaching and learning. His expertise includes leading institutional transformation, educational consulting, and advancing student success. Prior to joining higher education, he worked in K through 12 as a high school administrator and college counselor. H. Ray Keith holds a master's degree in higher education from the University of Denver and a bachelor's degree from Oklahoma City University. So Ray, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm so excited to be moderating this student and faculty panel. And so I'm going to ask that our um, panelists introduce themselves and we'll start with our students and then our faculty member, and then we'll get into our discussion. Go ahead, Mika or Brian, if you would introduce yourselves. Uh, my name is Mika Odara. I'm attending the University of Hawaii in Hilo uh, on the Big Island campus. My major is business management finance, and I'm also double majoring in Japanese studies. And I am an upcoming fourth year student. Nice to meet you. Hello there, I'm Brian Osiris. I go to the University of Central Florida. Uh, I'm a business major and I'm going into my third year studying integrated business. It's nice to meet all of you and I hope we have fun today. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Tasia Vandervet. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I'm a sociology instructor for about the last 10 years, and I also facilitate with the Association of College and University Educators, more commonly known as AQ. Uh, I facilitate their effective teaching practices, online and face-to-face -face versions, as well as their inclusive teaching for equitable learning micro-credential. Um, and then finally, I am myself also a student at the University of Wisconsin in the Educational Sustainability uh, Doctoral Program. Great, thank you all. Um, as we engage in this discussion, there'll be specific topic areas that we will focus on um, that advances student-centered, equity-minded, and inclusive teaching practices that lead to equitable outcomes that was addressed in the keynote uh, with Dr. Garth McCullough. And so we wanna kind of build off of those key takeaways um, from the student perspective and the faculty perspective. And so we'll get started with inclusivity and teaching and learning it in the classroom. And so we have a question for our students. How have you experienced inclusivity in the classroom? And we'll ask them to share examples of how um, their professors have made them feel included, how they've been affirmed, valued, and validated through instructional practices, policies, or building community that has embraced their culture, their lived experiences, and their identities. And so just jump right in. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is a really like basic thing that many of my professors did this past semester, and that was having like a set number of maybe two excuse absences or one excuse assignment that they give kind of a leeway to us students. And that allows us for like some flexibility with our own personal lives. Like if something comes up and I can't finish this assignment, then I know I can drop it at the very least. And having that like, again, flexibility and not having to like feel like I have to prove myself or justify my reasons to the professor that really made me feel like um, the professor was making an effort to adjust to my life and like make me feel heard in the course so that was really helpful for me thanks for sharing that Ryan did you want to have a response to that um, yeah, I agree. Recently, um, I've had one professor actually have a similar kind of course structure where he allows us to drop um, like a few quizzes and a few uh, assignments just in case, you know, anything happens. And that's really new to me because uh, one problem I usually have with professors or with the courseware is that I'm often made to feel kind of just like another student or another number. And they do that by like, I'll have an excuse for something like I, I want to complete my assignment, but I'm not able to. And it's kind of just like a tough luck situation, you know, better luck next time. And I'm trying to do my best as a student, while at the same time, I have other responsibilities. And so that can make it very difficult to feel valued by my uh, college when I'm not made to feel like a person. Great, thanks. And what I hear you all saying is really, um, you've had professors and uh, faculty members that take a holistic approach to how they're engaging you and not just seeing you as a math student or a business student, um, but really taking into account that you come with all of your whole self into the classroom, recognizing how they can embrace and support um, the other aspects of your life outside of college, which is great, thank you. And then for our faculty member, um, Tasia, could you uh, provide us some culturally responsive teaching practices that you put in place that create a student-centered envir environment while authentically engaging them holistically? Definitely. Um, I have two techniques and methods and teaching practices that I would like to share um, that I know have been pretty impactful. And the first has to do with assessment, especially around um, reading quizzes, you know, which are generally used to just kind of keep pace with, with what we're learning and, and make sure we're on the same page as we're coming to classes. Um, and I used to give multiple choice timed quizzes that were taken on our learning system on D2L. And these quizzes pulled a random 20 set of questions out of a question bank of 30 to 40 questions that I had written. Um, and I always hated it, uh, but I felt that it was really one of those things that, oh, it's just, you just have to do it. Reading quizzes are required. You've got to do them. Um, I did some research to try to support getting rid of 
quizzes altogether, which I did not find. Um, quizzes are beneficial in helping keep pace and checking learning, but I did learn that I could do them in different ways. And so what I did do is change the parameters for quizzing, um, where instead of it being one chance with a strict due date and time with a time limit, students were able to take the quiz up to three times. And so at the end of the quiz, they would see the questions that were answered incorrectly, um, but not the answers. And what this did was help promote um, an opportunity to go back and look and see what the answers would be to those questions, because they would know then what the theme was, the topic was that was missed, study again, um, and then come back and take the quiz again. They'd get a new set of 20 questions, but all around the same chapter. So it was hitting on the same topics. Um, I think this really promoted an opportunity to learn and, and encouraged you know, getting some credit for that additional effort put into reviewing the quiz and seeing kind of where space was still to grow. Um, and students reported appreciating that extra opportunity as Mika and Brian said there of, of sometimes things come up and you, you want to do it, but you don't have the time at that moment. And so having the opportunity to come back um, and that's what we really want from a quiz, right, is for students to have that opportunity to demonstrate knowledge and then also see where they have space to grow. So it doesn't have to be a punitive moment. Um, and I did see comparing across um, two semesters, the average quiz score go up by about two um, questions. And then the final exam score went up by about six questions. So that relearning and repracticing process was beneficial. Um, I actually don't use that method anymore in sociology. Um, I use what's called now a double entry journal, um, which is even more, um, I think, culturally responsive and really open ended for students. So they get the key terms from the chapter. One section of the quiz is to give it a definition, which usually is found in the textbook. And then the second uh, quiz box is just to explain that term. And that can be um, relating it to their personal lives, relating it to another example in class, something in a movie, something that their family has experienced. It can really be anything at all, um, so long as it's kind of showing how they've applied that, that topic. Um, I know that method isn't possible for all classes. There are courses with 100 students, and that would be a really <laughs> difficult thing to grade um, every single week for those, those courses. But I think you can make a hybrid of quizzes where some are multiple choice, and then there's a handful of questions that have that open-ended um, component to it. Um, the other big change I just wanted to talk about was kind of my shift um, on the perspective of how I define my role in the classroom. And I've really settled on thinking of myself as a curator um, that is there to kind of narrow down all of the topics that we can talk about um, into what students are interested in, but then still leaving options. So I teach a sociology of deviance course, and we have a lot of interesting topics like sexual deviance, mental health, physical disabilities. And for those sections, I usually will bring in five or seven articles around that idea. Um, so like for mental health, for example, we do an article on postpartum depression, PTSD, um, an article written by a professional hockey player who talks about the stress of being that in that role, um, eating disorders, and then students get to choose. And so then that gives them the opportunity to focus in on something that is related to the topic we are going to discuss, but has an impact that they get to choose like which uh, direction they want to go with it. And then we share out either through um, pairing up or doing a big group share out so everyone gets to hear the content of those um, articles. And, and that works really well online as well. Um, students can pick their own article and then share out about it in a discussion forum so that everyone in the class gets to see kind of how they reacted and responded to that article. So those are a couple of examples of what I have changed over the years. Great, thanks Tasia. Um, Brian, Mika, did you all have any other things that you wanted to share um, in regards to how your professors could be more inclusive in their teaching and learning? I have one thing. This is not something I've experienced personally, but um, in my in internship with ELE and OLC, we were talking a lot about how to make forums in class better and more inclusive. And what we concluded from that is to allow for like multimedia submissions, not just like a question and a text answer and every student has to do that. But if you have like a prompt and if students want to submit like an artwork or a voice recording or a video, to allow room for that and like create an environment where that's not something students would be hesitant to do, um, then that would be really grateful for expanding the learning experience, I think. Thank you. 
Uh, so what I think for a professor to be more inclusive, um, one of the ways I like see how inclusive a professor or, or an educator is in general is by what they allow uh, in their classroom. Kind of like what Mika was saying, uh, allowing people to submit uh, in various different ways. But for me, I'm thinking more along the lines of uh, this can't be done for every class, but for classes where discussion is is heavy, allowing for uh, difference of opinions even to be brought up in in the classroom, or even if it's an online discussion, allowing that to be brought up, as long as there's um, a mutual sense of respect or uh, understanding, so that no one uh, really feels like they've been personally attacked but that this is just an opinion with and a respectful discussion. Great, thank you all. So this is gonna lead us into our next topic and really wanted to think about how are we designing our classes? Um, how are we utilizing student experience, and their voice and perspective um, as we create our classes, as we think about our curriculum and our teaching practices. And so um, for our students, what does your ideal learning experience um, look like and, and provide an example of that. Uh, in my experience, I, I feel I learn best in a course where um, I feel like I have a stake in the class, like going back to what Brian said in the beginning, like not feeling that I'm just a name on the roster or just like an anonymous face in the crowd, but actually feeling like my opinions and my inputs are being taken seriously in the course. And I understand that like in a big class, you can't really like take everybody's input, but you know, it doesn't have to be like students input doesn't have to be on big things like curriculum or what we study. It can be on small things like um, when should we have the next quiz or for the next assignment, should we do an essay or um, short answer, things like that. Like getting to decide those small things is really empowering for me. And it makes me feel like, oh, I actually get a say in what I, what I do in this course. And I find that in courses that allow me to do that, um, I perform better in general. I think for two reasons, for number one, I think because I respect the professor more, so I don't really want to disappoint them. Um, the second reason is just like, just because I feel I have a higher stake in the class, I try harder, I make more of an effort. So that would be my ideal learning experience. Great, thanks Nika. Uh, so something I've struggled with uh, for my college is the fact that most of our business courses are online and I've just been so used to the K through 12 education where it's like everyone sees each other face to face. We all get to talk to each other. We all get to form an interpersonal connection. And now that I'm doing most of my classes online and maybe like seeing the professor in person like once a month it really is difficult for me to have that interpersonal connection and really connect with my classes personally. Um, and so what I'm thinking is maybe that the professor or the dean, whoever's in charge of the courseware makes it uh, possible for students who excel with online learning to access courseware online. And at the same time for students who excel uh, more in person to allow there to be uh, a more lecture heavy portion of the class. And so students get a choice between how they learn with that same professor, either through online learning or uh, the in-person lectures the professor would hold. Great, thanks for sharing that, Brian. Um, yeah, as we think about how we're designing courses, are we even um, communicating that with our students? Are we engaging our students and bringing them into that process? Um, because again, this is, they're share, they will be able to share how they learn best and how do we then um, change our practices or transform our practices so that students are having equitable experiences, but also having experiences in the classroom that are meaningful to them. Thanks. Um, our second question for our students is, how does taking an inclusive approach in the classroom impact your student experience? I think Brian, you spoke about that a little bit, but um, could you all expand and maybe provide an example um, how this impacts your experience um, with learning and also engaging with your faculty members and your peers. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Can you repeat it? 
how does um, your professors taking an inclusive approach um, to their teaching and learning impact your experience as a student? Valued as an individual and as a person. And like Mika was saying, when I get to decide how I learn or when I learn, I feel more empowered and more like my education is in my own hands, which I think is what college is really supposed to be about. Uh, just taking your own direction in life and being able to, you know, make your own road. Yeah, I like that, Brian, uh, really giving students the opportunity to, to uh, take ownership of their learning. Great. Thank you. I agree with Brian as well on the same line it essentially all these efforts to like make the classroom more inclusive it just helps me learn more and more effectively in the long run I think if I feel like the education system or a particular course doesn't make room for um, somebody who learns my way or a learner like me then of course I won't try as hard or I won't put as much effort in and in doing that I won't retain as much so just being reassured that uh, my voice is being heard and I have a say in this, how my education goes, that like motivates me to, to try harder and to, Great. to really. Thank you. And then Tasia, um, how have you collected or gathered student feedback? Um, and how do you use that to inform the way you uh, change your teaching practices and make sure that your practices are meaningful for the student? Yeah, I um, really like to do a lot of surveying um, during the course, uh, and I always start the semester with a survey um, using, I, I like to use Google Forms a lot because it does such a beautiful job making graphics and, and designs out of responses that come through, so then it's very easy to share out and kind of see patterns. Um, at the beginning, I use um, a Google form and I, you know, try to use it as a space for us to get to know each other, especially in online courses where you're not going to have that group opportunity um, to meet face to face. And this is where I learn about um, preferred communication methods with students if they have a personal email or it would be helpful to be able to text message. Um, I use a Google phone number for text messaging with students so that I can still have my, you know, separate communication for my personal life. Um, and then this survey also has space for students to share their excitements and concerns about the class. Um, they can share about their lives outside of school if they want to. And often I'll hear about um, students that are parents or how much they work or if they're caring for family members or maybe they share a computer. Um, and I learn a lot in that scenario and in those moments that helps me kind of adjust and adapt and know kind of what um, our schedules are going to look like going into, into the semester. Um, and then I have um, an effective way to reach out to students too if I have something I want to communicate or I want to touch base or something. Um, at the mid-semester, I have another survey, and but this one is more based on what we've done so far in the, in the course. So it'll ask which topics have been the most interesting and the least interesting, which activities we enjoyed, which ones we did not enjoy, um, and then a space for the general feedback. And then that helps me decide what the second half of the semester can look like. If there was activities that were not resonating, then we get rid of those and, and pick different ones. Uh, but then I also know if something is working really well. And then this is also a space where I ask students if they wanna share anything about um, how they're feeling about equity and inclusion in the classroom. So they can share uh, moments that they do or do not feel included. Um, things that could be changed to increase inclusivity. And then if they have any, they've noticed any patterns in how the classroom engages, um, that helps me kind of um, mesh with my personal observations. Um, we always look at the results together. This is a super important part of any type of surveying is that follow up of sharing the results. And again, that's why I like to use Google Forms because then it turns it into beautiful graphics <laughs> for me. Um, I don't have to do it. And then, um, you know, we share and discuss what adjustments can be made following that. So as uh, Mika and Brian said, you know, there's obviously we know that some of the content can't be changed. We have things we have to address as part of the course. Um, but I think that if um, you feel that the survey process is intimidating because of, of those, those places where you can't make changes, it's totally fine to present that and just be transparent of this is not a thing that can be changed and here's why, right? This is a course learning outcome, we have to do it, or I have to have grades in by this certain date, so 
this it has to be submitted by this time. Um, and that transparency will often alleviate um, the desire for it to be changed from the students. It's just a matter of sharing why, why is it that this is in place this way. Um, I also give the same survey at the end of the term, including all of the topics that we covered. So I can get, again, another sense for upcoming terms, um, which uh, topics did we like the best, which activities did we like the best and least. Um, uh, these mid-course surveys and end-of-course surveys are always anonymous. I think that's really important to get authentic feedback and create a space of safety for students to share authentically. Um, to encourage participation, what I'll do is set up a scenario where if 90% of students take the survey, for example, then everyone gets some extra credit points. So there's still some motivation there, but I don't have to be tracking who took it, um, just that a certain percentage did. Uh, and so again, I would just say the single most important thing is about giving the follow-up, um, reviewing what was shared, discussing what comes of it. Um, and just this is super important because skipping this step can actually have that opposite effect and create exclusion um, and making the students feel as though it was a waste of their time to take that survey if they never get to hear what comes of it. So um, we're going to move into our final question and really begin to think about next steps and takeaways. And so for our student panelists, um, what can your faculty members or what can faculty, faculty members um, do in the next semester? Be really specific about strategies, tools, um, and practices that you would recommend um, faculty put into place over the next semesters. The main thing from my experience would be to establish um, a solid communication, a way to communicate with your students. Um, like Tasha was saying, with um, whether that be through surveys or, sorry, was it surveys that you were talking about? I just, right. <laughs> whether that be through like midterm or like end of the semester surveys, I think that's a really effective way to communicate with the students and get our feedback. But Essentially, each group of students is going to have different needs and different styles of learning. So I think establishing like a classroom environment where we're not afraid to give our opinions and criticism of the course, I think that's the most important thing. Um, specifically, though, I think just implementing the like the practices we talked about earlier, like having options for multimedia submissions and allowing for you know, excuse absences or excuse assignments, those things, those kind of things would be really helpful. Great. Um, I would say that opening up office hours so that uh, students would be able to come in and see you if uh, they have questions about any specific courseware or um, any specific uh, assignment that you have uh, in the course because sometimes I'll find that I'm struggling with the question and I'm not really, or I, my schedule doesn't line up with theirs or with my professor specifically. And so I have to email them and kind of uh, schedule maybe like a, a interested meeting or a Zoom call that's outside of their office hours. And that's always a relief to me knowing that, yeah, even though I'm not able to make it to your office hours, I can, you still have some time that you can, you know, squeeze in for some of you students. And that makes me feel like, you know, appreciative of my professors and what they're doing for their students. That's a great point, Brian. I know uh, during the pandemic and, and even currently, one of my colleagues um, changed their office hours and they were very specific about making sure that their office hours um, truly met their student schedule. And so they were having office hours in the evenings. Um, uh, and, and again, the office hours, students begin to utilize those, those office hours in a, a more meaningful way, but also helping students understand um, what it really means to be able to use those office hours and what are those office hours for. We use a lot of language um, jargon in higher education. And many times I've heard students say, um, you know, office hours is a time where I shouldn't really be bothering my, my instructor or my professor because I think that's time for them to be in their office doing their work. And so how do we communicate um, what those office hours really are for 
and, and help students understand and, and center students in that in that space so that students understand that that, that office hours yeah. are really good. Um, any other practices or um, ways that, that faculty can engage or change their practices um, as they think about moving into um, the fall semester, but even, even the summer semester, what are some things that student that um, professors might be able to do? And I want to hear from Mika and Brian, and then we're going to move to, uh, Tasia is going to share some information as well. Yeah, uh, something I just thought of was uh, opening up a discussion board of some kind on uh, like Canvas or something, because that's what we use. I'm not sure if everyone uses that. Um, but just opening it up because everything is so condensed in the summer that, uh, and you know, the classes aren't as large, but everything goes by so quickly. So maybe a student will be hoping for an answer as soon as possible. And so they'll uh, post it to like a Q and A discussion board or something along those lines and they can expect a quicker reply. That's a great idea. Thanks, Brian. All right, so take, oh, go ahead, Mika. Oh, no, not at all. I was, um, I was struggling to come up with something specific, but just on a more general note, um, maybe like in like having classroom instructions that are more like catered towards the area or the culture that the students from. And what I mean is like, um, like small things like textbook examples. In my class, we used to have things that are like, um Sally went skydiving or something like that but in Hawaii like nobody skydives so if you switch that to like Sally went canoeing or Sally went fishing it'd be more applicable to our area that's a great example how are we making sure that our um, curriculum and content is culturally relevant to the students that we're serving um and, and so that's a key thing is, is Rwanda was talking about interrogating our, our practices thinking about the content in the, the uh, textbooks that we're using and who's being represented um, in those texts. So great, thank you. So Tasia, what advice or recommendations do you have for faculty um, as they begin integrating student-centered teaching um, in the courses and how can they do that right now? Yeah, good. Um, I really appreciate this question because uh, so many times we go to professional learning situations and we're left with a lot to think about um, but without um, a lot of set of tang tangible steps, um, things that can be done very simply if you utilize quizzes and you utilize your learning management system to distribute those quizzes, so D2L, Canvas, um, what have you, um, really consider how you can make those more geared toward learning instead of memorization and penalty. Um, you know, this idea that students should be able to learn something on the first try, I think, is a really detrimental mentality towards quizzes, especially. Um, so if you're in a space where you might want to try out the multiple attempts or um, to Mika and Brian's point, modifying you know, kind of the limitations of a due date um, to allow for, you know, changes to somebody's schedule or their availability. Um, changing these things in an LMS is so super simple. Uh, it's built in. So you go to the quizzes, to the settings, you change it to allow for three attempts. You mark it to export the average grade out of the textbook or out of the grade book or the highest grade or whatever your decision is there. And that's really all you have to do. It requires no additional setup on your part. So it's a very simple step to, to um, chart changing the narrative around what a quiz is. Um, I think another um, simple assignment um, that touches on points that Mika and Brian have both made as well is a choose your own reading assignment. This requires really no setup from you as the instructor, except maybe um, setting the foundation for how to pick an article or a reading that will have enough content and meat to it to lend itself to a good analysis, and then writing some general reflection questions. Um, this is another thing I do in my Sociology of Deviance course is um, allowing two of the weeks students bring in their own reading. And as long as they can provide a copy so I can read it or a link to where I can read it, then that's um, that allows me to 
to kind of see what they were checking in on and, and see how their reflection went. Um, but that's it. And then that opens up a big space for student choice. It opens up a big space for students to kind of dive into a realm that is more interesting to them, more specific. It takes um, the idea that I have to make all the decisions about what's interesting away from me because I know it's interesting to me, but students have other things that are interesting to them. Um, and some of the articles that come in are so fantastic and on point with exactly what we talk about that the next semester I just use them as a regular reading. So there's also some work that goes into that that allows me to integrate things that have been chosen before. Um, I think this is something that can be pretty good in most disciplines if you don't have um, say a heavy like reading article load, it could be a choose your own example assignment. Um, so a math or science class could allow students to bring in their own example of, of whatever um, topic or content was, was done that week. Um, and that, again, takes a load actually off of an instructor of having to find every single moment of a class time space, how they're going to engage that. Uh, I had actually written down as a note as well, um, engaging student choice for allowing different forms of submissions, uh, but Mika and Brian brought that up already, but in an online discussion forum, especially, it's so simple to have a text submission, a video submission, an audio file submission, a concept map, or a piece of art, um, any of those things to come in. And I think that that not only engages different levels of cognitive thinking and cognitive skills, um, it also keeps it fresh and uh, some variety for faculty who are reading and students who are reading as well to get to engage all of those different things. Um, Setting up a survey, also very easy, you know, name, best way to contact you. What are you excited about? What are you nervous about? What else do you want me to know? Um, Google doesn't require an email address for people to participate. So it's a free tool that's very helpful. Uh, and I think my last thing is that, um, you know, with everything that is going to be discussed today and has already been shared, just to remember that small steps towards equity are beneficial steps. Um, engaging culture responsive teaching does not have to mean that you spend the next four weeks before the fall semester redoing everything and, you know, shredding your syllabus and starting all over. That definitely does not have to be it. That's too much. It's overwhelming. And I think that overwhelming sense can sometimes be a barrier to even getting started. Um, so I would say after you leave today, pick a few techniques that you hear about, um, get those going into your summer or fall classes get established and then just continue picking new steps to engage each semester because again every step is is a good step towards equity. Okay. Thank you Tasia. It's so important as we engage in this work um, to, to Tasia's point that we do this incrementally um, because it does seem very daunting to think about I'm going to make an entire course culturally responsive and so uh, thanks for that advice Tasia. I really appreciate it. I want to say thank you to our amazing student panelists. Um, I'm honored to be in space with you. And, and as we engage in this work, student voice is critical and so important to uh, becoming inclusive, student-centered, and culturally responsive uh, faculty members and to, to transform our teaching practices. Um, and so making sure that student voice um, is centered in everything that you're doing as you think about um, being inclusive and transforming your practices. I want to thank Tasia as a panelist as well. Thank you for your insight and all the great things that you're doing that, that are imp impacting the student experience. And so now I'm going to turn it back over to Brian, who's going to um, give us our next steps for the for the conference. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Ray. Um, yeah, and just to just to echo Ray's sentiments, uh, thanks so much to our two students, Brian and Mika. Uh, thank you to Tasia for uh, offering a really um, valuable instructor perspective to go along with this, the excellent examples and sort of thoughtful insight that the students had. And thank you, Ray, for facilitating this uh, terrific discussion. Um, just want to remind everyone that this uh, concludes the webinar portion of today's summit. Um, so you should all have a schedule in your inbox with the links to the, uh, the later sessions, um, which uh, Megan kind of gave an overview of at the beginning of this, of this uh, session. Um, I'm going to put a schedule I'm gonna put the schedule um, in the chat as well. Hopefully that works. Um, but you can also send me an email if for some reason you don't have um, the schedule for today. And I'd be happy to send it to you. 
Um, and just as a final reminder um, to everyone, um, please stick around through the full summit, um, which is uh, the last session ends at about 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, at that time, we will have a, a survey, a very short survey for you to fill out. And by filling out that survey, that's how you'll earn your digital badge uh, for attending the summit today and also be entered into uh, a drawing to win either a 100 uh, or a $50 gift card. Um, so just wanna encourage everyone to stick around for the uh, full slate of um, sessions today and hope you enjoy them. Thanks everyone.